Attention shoppers, iPads are now 90% off for the next 60 seconds. Attention shoppers, our iPad sale is now over. The History of Utah, according to Kendall Wilcox Jr., son of Kendall Wilcox Sr., by Caroline Wilcox. Unlike generations before me, I don't know how to drive, and neither do my friends. Antique cars are driven by old people for recreation. All transportation is done by driverless electric vehicles. Single rider vehicles are banned for except e-bikes and e-scooters in order to eliminate traffic congestion. Neuralink implants and retinal projection technology enable VR, AR, and hologram communication, and I don't remember a world without them. Retail had been entirely transformed by online or virtual shopping in the past 40 years. The previous 60 years were defined by the use of the car for transportation. Except for a brilliant idea from my grandfather, Kendall Wilcox Sr., scenes like these would have otherwise be just scenes from history. This is how it was explained to me. Dad, I have an essay due. What's it about? It's about the history of retail. Interesting. What time frame? The year 2000 and later. Your grandpa would know a lot about that. Really? Why? You worked for Walmart for 30 years. What? I didn't know that. Yes, if he was still alive, he would love to tell you all about it. Well, do you know anything about it? You're old. Thanks. Here, I'm going to send you a neural link so you can see what I'm talking about. In 2020, the year of the coronavirus pandemic, Grandpa was closing in on a 25-year career in retail. He decided to go back to school and was getting his master's degree at the University of Arkansas while working full-time at Walmart. I was your age, so he would have been about 50. Anyway, back then people had to drive themselves everywhere. Autonomous vehicles had just been invented, but weren't legal yet. Most people still went to the store for everything they needed to buy. Online shopping was a thing, but was really inconvenient. Now you don't even really think about what you need. It just shows up in the fridge, the pantry, or at the front door. In fact, the coronavirus was the thing that really kicked online shopping into gear. It took 25 years to get to just 11% of retail, and then jumped to 30% in less than two months. Since Neuralink and retinal projection contacts took off, nobody really leaves their homes now. Today, you can just think about where you want to be, and there you are, virtually, and you don't even have to move a muscle to do it. Well, as Walmart's pickup program was taking off, they were opening up fulfillment centers in low-budget or abandoned retail spaces. What most people called Black Friday was held on the day after Thanksgiving and kicked off the holiday shopping season. Your grandfather suggested that the Black Friday sales could be held outside these fulfillment centers, drastically increasing the number of store locations and increasing sales significantly. I would go with my friends to what we called the event. Driving up, we would see lines of people waiting to get into the arena. They put the pickup operation on pause for a few hours and pulled pallets into the front of the fulfillment center and put up guard fences around them to control the situation. We usually didn't get in until most everything was gone, but it was amazing to watch all the people tearing through the pallets of merchandise. So we would go back every year just to watch, and so did a lot of other people. Eventually, they moved the event to the first weekend in June to jumpstart the summer shopping season and added Grand Scion-style seating created out of pallets so people could see better. They implemented a lottery system due to customer complaints about running out of merchandise, but regardless, people just kept coming to watch. I loved to go, and we would hang out there before and after it, tailgating like at a football game. About that time, your grandfather convinced Walmart that creating medium to high density residential and commercial centers in its giant parking lots would drive business to their stores, which by then were primarily fulfillment centers, reducing their delivery times and last mile costs significantly. Eventually, the anemic shopping center was on the list as one of the first for Walmart to convert. 
By then, crowds and tailgating at the event were growing significantly, and a wave of shopping center conversions began that drastically changed the face of most cities and towns in the United States, converting suburban space into urban places. As part of the design for the new urban spaces, low-impact development criteria was implemented, which among many things created a more pedestrian feel. Low-impact development integrates urban forests, biophilic urban landscapes, and water treatment through constructed wetlands, treating water and feeding it back into the aquifer. These constructed wetlands landscaped with native grasses are a simple feature that have become a big part of the quality and value of the development. Over time, these features became standard as they were widely implemented as part of a more comprehensive plan to limit the worst effects of climate change. Interestingly, this was something your grandfather had studied and promoted during his undergraduate studies in the late 20th century, but didn't pursue until he came back to school for his master's degree. As Walmart redeveloped the shopping center, it created a new event space. Now formalized into a festival, a plaza was designed to be the home of the event with food trucks and novelty retail experiences. It started as a single-day event where they blocked off streets and set up the pallet grandstands in the plaza. Generally, people didn't drive cars at the time, but there were still a few who had not converted over to a ride subscription service. Most people rode their e-bikes and scooters or came in buses. It was originally modeled after the farmer's markets that were very popular at the time and have continued to grow since. This is one of the few retail experiences that is still done in real life rather than virtually. As you walk down Main Street, you could see the big Walmart Spark Palette sculpture, which was where all the participants, whom we nicknamed the mob, would go and check in. The rest of us would find one of the brightly colored palette awnings on the back side of the canopies and find a place to sit. Grandpa designed the grandstand canopies to walk through from the back and enter into the arena. It was quite an incredible sight to walk through the narrow entry and have it open up to the arena. There was a giant spiral in the center of the arena and a spark logo at the center tunnel entry. The mob lined up in the tunnels and would wait to be announced into the arena. It all seemed a little medieval as no one had ever seen anything like it. A DJ played loud music to get the crowd amped up and everyone would dance. Walmart associates lined the perimeter of the arena and on the stage integrated into the spiral palette sculpture to keep everything organized and running smoothly. They would eventually announce the entry of the mob with smoke and a fog machine, and the mob rushed out around the arena and started dancing. The arena was designed to hold about 300 people, but who knows how many people actually got packed in there. When the music stopped, the mayhem began. It was a huge party, and getting in to watch the mob was amazing, but most just came to have a fun time and enjoy the atmosphere. Your grandfather hoped that it would eventually become a large palette sculpture festival, similar to the ice carnival that he and your grandma went to on their first date. After several years and even more development, Walmart decided that they would memorialize the event with a permanent structure and commissioned your grandpa to design it. The Walton family sponsored its construction and they were really into tinsel structures, having commissioned two other ones in the area previously. While those ones eventually went away, this one still exists to this day. This was also the year that they installed the new fountain in the center of the space and converted the plaza into a seasonal splash pad in the summer and an ice rink in the winter. The festival got bigger and your grandpa continued to design palette sculptures. Eventually, other artists were invited, but the last year that he designed all of them is the one I remember best. You might remember it. You were about eight at the time. He designed two towers that stood at the entrance greeting all that arrived. You then walked through a pallet pavilion which served as a gateway into the festival. This was the entry into what Walmart would have called the Action Alley, created by pop-up shops constructed entirely of pallets lining both sides of the street. On the left, there were a set of sibling rotundas that faced each other. Tucked off to either side were outdoor living rooms, set so you could rest and relax. At the main intersection, there was a sculpture that was a combination of a sphinx mixed with a bald eagle perched there, guarding and monitoring all of the festivities. Across the street, there was a giant tree made entirely out of pallets. We were all amazed that it did not fall over. Some were scared to walk under it. Grandpa said that it was the most difficult pallet sculpture he had ever engineered. There were also a set of three strange towers next to the event that I never figured out. 
Finally, Grandpa explained to me that from a specific vantage point, they represented the pine trees that were native to the mountains in Idaho that he loved. Where the road split, one side led off to more pop-up shops, and the other was filled with food trucks offering culinary delights of every kind. This area is still one of the most popular places to live, work, and visit in the entire northwest Arkansas area. It is the location of major community events and is busy every weekend with farmers markets to community and regional concerts, first Friday, third Thursday, and almost every holiday celebration. Since then, the event festival has expanded to take over the entire development, filling the streets with pop-up merchandise of every kind. Grandpa said that he took inspiration for all of it, the tent, the landscape, and even the paving from the origins of the event. He had finally contributed all that he could after 45 years in retail design, dedicated to improving the everyday lives of millions of people in very simple but often profound ways that they may never have noticed, but must have appreciated because they kept coming back every week for more. The event is a memorial to those that had dedicated their lives to a career of serving their customers and creating enjoyable experiences while they shopped. So, Caroline, did you get enough for your report? Huh, what? Yeah, but could you say that all over again? I wasn't listening. My favorite boy band just went live. Kind of got distracted.